F7 here, which is polynomial optimization. This is going to be the heart of our calculus class. Okay, Everything we've learned so far is in the purpose, not solely, but one of its main uses is to solve optimization problems. Okay, So this is like the most classic example of calculus being used, solve an optimization problem. So optimization means the biggest or smallest point. Optimize. Find the biggest point or the smallest point. Okay. So from this func function that's pictured here, it didn't project that well on the screen, but it should be fine on your notes. Um, identify the x-coordinates of all local maxima and minima. Where do you have a local max and local min? Yep, so local extrema happen at B. Okay, so this point right here is a local max. Then we have a local min here at D. Then we have another one at F. B, D, F. Yeah, basically anywhere it turns around. We have a local max or a local min, and that looks like H. B, D. Local means it's not the highest point on the whole graph, but in its little neighborhood it's the highest point or the lowest point, right? Like, look at F, right? Yeah, so F right here, it's not the highest point in this whole picture because that would happen at B, right? But in, if you just look near F, it's the highest point. So that's why we call it local. Um, this would have to be at least a fifth degree polynomial, yeah, because it has four um, local extrema. And the end behavior indicates odd degree. Okay, so notice that at each of the local extrema that we just observed, the tangent line is horizontal. Okay, at each of these points, if I were to draw a tangent line, it's horizontal. So, but it is possible to have um, a local extreme where you can't draw a horizontal tangent line. Okay. So it's possible to have a relative extreme where the tangent line is not flat. For example, this picture here, we have a relative extreme here. But what can you say about the derivative right there? It's a corner, which means it's undefined. Right. All right. So we summarize our observations with this. Um, theorem that's proved in the book, we won't prove it, but it's called Fermat's theorem, and it says if f has a local max or min at the x value c, then either f prime of c equals zero, which means the tangent line is horizontal, or f prime of c does not exist, right, because the derivative is undefined. We have a corner or a discontinuity. So we call x a critical number of the function if f prime of x equals 0 there, or if f prime of x is, is not defined there. Okay. So the above theorem, Fermat's theorem, it tells us that the only place that a relative extreme may occur is at a critical number. So if you're looking for relative extremes, you're looking for places where the derivative equals 0, or the derivative is undefined. All right, so going back to the first graph in the section, so we'll scroll back up in a second, we want to identify the x-coordinates of all global maxima and minima on the interval from A to J. Okay, so we're looking from A to J, and I want to find the global maximum and the global minimum, which is the highest point and the absolute lowest point. Yeah, so D is definitely the location of the lowest point in the whole interval, right? Just looking from A to J right here. Here's my interval. The lowest point in there definitely happens at D. So we have a global min at D. Okay, and then what's the highest point from a, between A and J? J. 
j. This is just a teeny bit higher, yeah. So that happens at j. So that's my global max, which is j. OK, so D was a critical point, right? D is a local min critical point because the tangent line's horizontal there. Is J, is there anything special about J? Is it a critical number? No. Tangent line at J is not horizontal. Ten the derivative is not undefined. So what is it about J that identifies it as the global max? It happens to be the highest point. On the interval. And and J is the end point of the interval, right? So there's something intrinsically special about D, or critical about D, right? Because it has a horizontal tangent line. But there's nothing special about J except that it's the end point of the interval, right? It's sort of artificially important because it happens to go on the end point of the interval and that's the highest value. Okay, so. So if you're looking for global extremes, they could happen at critical points, critical values, but they can also happen at the end of the interval. So you got to also check the endpoints. So in general, if you're looking for absolute extrema of a continuous function on a closed interval, just evaluate the function at each of the critical points and at the endpoints and grab the highest and lowest values. So this is an analytic method for identifying global maxima and minima for when you don't have a picture, right? If you have a picture, you just look at it and pick out the highest and lowest values, right? This is an analytic method for finding them when you don't have a picture. And this analytic method is going to come back again and again and again this semester. We're going to use it so many times. I hope you get sick of it. Right, because it's important. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right. So here's my first example of um, finding global extrema. So we know that global extrema can only happen at critical values and at the endpoints of the interval. So the first thing I want to find are the critical values. I have the interval one to five, so my endpoints are one and five. I need to find all the critical values. And critical values happen when the derivative equals 0 or the derivative is undefined. Okay, So I need to find when is my derivative equal to 0 or undefined. So in order to find out where the derivative is 0 and where the derivative is undefined, I have to take the derivative. right? So what is the derivative of 2x cubed minus 15x squared plus 36? Yeah, yep. So this is, this is the power rule that we learned last class. You take that exponent, the 3 on the x cubed on the leading term, bring it down in front, and it multiplies by the coefficient that's already there. So the 3 times 2 gives you 6. Copy the x, reduce the exponent by 1. So you get 6x squared. Next term, follow the same rule. You take that 2, bring it down to the negative 15, multiply them together, and you get negative 30. Copy the x, reduce the exponent by 1, and you get x to the first, which is just x. So I'm not going to write the 1. Then you do the same thing on 36x. That says 36x to the first, right? Take the 1 on the x, bring it down in front. 36 times 1 is 36. Copy the x, reduce the exponent by 1, and you get x to the 0. But what is anything to the 0? 1. So this says 36 times 1, which is just plain old 36. So I want to set that equal to 0 and solve it to find the critical numbers. Right? And we need to know where is the derivative 0. So how do I factor this? Take out a 6, yep. And so I'm left with x squared minus 5x plus 6 equals 0. Does that factor any further? Negative 3 and, nope, both negative. So 
So that means that x equals 2 and 3 are my solutions to where the derivative equals 0. Okay. And wherever the derivative equals 0, that means you have a horizontal tangent line. Right? So that's why we set the derivative equal to 0. We're looking for horizontal tangent lines because tangent lines are horizontal at local extremes. So I have horizontal tangent lines at 2 and 3. So these are what we call critical numbers. Sometimes we call them critical points, critical values. Different books call it different things, and I kind of use them all interchangeably. Critical numbers at 2 and at 3. So we have some kind of horizontal tangent line at 2 and at 3. Those are potential extremes. So I should write this. These are potential extreme values. So if I would like to know <clears throat> the very highest and the very lowest point on this interval, it's either going to happen at one of these two values or at the endpoints. So I'm just going to evaluate all of them. So I'm going to have x and my original function f of x, because that's what I'm trying to find extremes of, extremes of f. So I'm going to do my endpoints of the interval my critical and my critical values. So my endpoints were 1 and 5. Critical values are 2 and 3. I just got to plug those guys into my function f, my original function, to figure out which one's the biggest and which one's the smallest. Okay, so here's my function 2x cubed. So 1 cubed is 1 times 2 is 2, minus 15 is negative 13, plus 36 is 23. All right, so then for 2, 2 cubed is 8, times 2 is 16, minus uh, 60 plus 72. So that's 12 and 16 is 28. Did I do that right? Okay. Um, I might not be able to do three in my head. 27. And what's the other one? Sorry, what? 55. Okay, which, so which of these y values, function values, is the smallest? Having that one, the smallest y value is 23. So this is my global minimum. Happens at 1, 23. And which is the biggest one? 5, 55. This is my global maximum. So my global min and my global max happened at the endpoints of this interval. So in the day that calculus was invented, um, we couldn't check this with graphing technology, but now we can. So let's just graph this polynomial and, and verify that on the interval 1 to 5, these are actually the lowest and highest point. So there we go, saved in the notes now. All right, so that's the procedure. So I got one more. This one, instead of being sort of just an abstract example of a random polynomial, we have a real situation that I need to optimize. So a math book is to contain 36 square inches of printed matter per page. So every page is supposed to have 36 square inches printed on it. And the margins are supposed to be one inches along each side, one and a half inches along the top and the bottom. We want to find the dimensions of a page that will require the minimum amount of paper to have the appropriate margins and put in the appropriate amount of um, type. So hint, we're going to let L and W be the length and the width of the part of the page that is printed on. So in general, in solving an optimization problem, or any word problem really, draw a picture first. First thing you should always do. So I've got a page 
of math textbook. And it's going to have margins one inch on the sides, one and a half inches on the top and the bottom. So I'll draw in my margins. So this distance here is 1.5 inches, and this distance here is 1 inch. And then say that again? Not necessarily. It could be 6 by 6 um, because we need 36 square inches, but it could also be 12 and 3. Oh. would also multiply to 36. Right? So we need to figure out how should we make these dimensions so that we minimize the amount of paper that we use. So my hint is let L and W be the length and the width of the part of the page that's printed on. So that's the inner part here. So let's call this um, L and W. So what does L times W have to equal? 36. We need 36 square inches of printed matter. All right, so I have two unknowns here, L and W. When two unknowns, you always need two equations. Yep. So I need to come up with some other kind of equation. And what do you think? What's a quadratic? Okay, yeah, so I can I could come up with dimensions for the outer part of the page. Yeah, so I'm going to have W plus what? Oh, two. two, yeah, because here's W, and then you got to go this way and this way. So you got to add one on each end, so it's actually W plus two is the outer dimension. And then what's the outer length dimension? L plus 3. Okay, and if I'm still talking area, the area of my outer, of my whole page is L plus 2, sorry, L plus 3 times W plus 2. And this is what I want to minimize, because I want to minimize the amount of paper I use. I want to minimize the area of the paper. Right? That's how you measure the amount of paper you're using, is area. So I want to minimize area, okay? but this area function has two variables in it, and this is just single variable calculus. So what do I do? Solve for one of the variables. That's why I have this other equation. L times W is 36. Solve for, I don't know, L. So L is 36 over W. Put that into the area function. So we've got area is going to be 36 over W plus 3 times W plus 2. Now that's a function I can try to optimize or minimize. So think of this as, instead of A's, Y's, and instead of W's, X's, and this is just a function just like the one we just did. So I'm going to multiply this out. So I get area is when I FOIL, 36 over W times W is 36. Okay, my outer term, 36 over W times 2, that's 72 over W. My inner term plus 3w, and then my last terms plus 6. I've got some like terms here. I'm going to move over here. So area is going to be 36 plus 6 is 42, plus 72 over w. Could I write that as um, something I could apply the power rule to? How would I rewrite it? 72w to the negative 1 plus 3w. So there's a formula for the area of the whole page if you know the width. So if I want to maximize this thing, or minimize it, I want to find the global minimum, I need to find the critical values, possible extremes, 
and the endpoints. You need to know the endpoints of the interval. So what's my what's my interval for W? Like what W's make sense? What's the smallest W could be? W itself. Don't look at W plus two. Zero W could be zero. I mean it couldn't actually be zero, but because you wouldn't have a piece of paper. Right? But so maybe I'll I won't put an or equal to, I'll just put zero. So the smallest we could do is, is make the width approach zero, and then you just have to have like a super, super long length to get the 36 square inches. And then what's the biggest we could make W? Yeah. Which is zero. That is zero. Why are you messing with me right now, Cooper? <laughs> um, we're going to say zero is the limit of how small W can be. It can't actually get there, but its limit is zero. Okay, and then what's the biggest I could make W? Four? How do you get that? 34, how do you get that? Don't even think about the plus two, right? So just look at this dimension here. You could, technically, you could actually make it as big as you want, right? You just have to make L teeny, teeny, tiny to compensate. Like, so if I made the width 100, is there some L that I could use to make this inside region have an area of 36? Yeah. Reasonably, yeah. But um, I am going to put infinity, right? I could make it as big as I want. I would just have to compensating by, by making L really, really, really small. Just like I can make W as close to zero as I want, I would just have to make L really, really, really big. Okay, so those are the endpoints of my interval. So I'm going to have to see what happens near zero and near infinity instead of right at there. So we'll see here. All right, so critical values happen when the derivative equals zero. So I take the derivative of this thing, a prime, and what's the derivative of 42? Nothing. Um, 72w to the negative 1. I bring the negative 1 down, multiply by the 72, copy the w, decrease negative 1 by 1, and you get negative 2. And then the derivative of 3w is 3. And I need to set that thing equal to zero to find critical values. So it might help if I rewrite instead of w to the negative 2, I put over w squared. So I'm going to move it to the other side. So I took that negative 72 w to the negative 2, I added it to both sides, and then I just rewrote. 72 w to the negative 2 as 72 over w squared. Hmm? This is a negative 72 w to the negative, so I added it to both sides. Yeah, so then I could multiply both sides by w squared, so I have 3 w squared equals 72. W squared is going to be divide by 3, yeah, 24. And then take the square root of 24. We'll just say 4.9, how about that? <laughs> so W should be positive or negative 4.9. Because this is measuring the width of a page, we can ignore the negative, right? It doesn't make any sense. Ignore the negative. So 4.9 inches. To find the length, yeah. So the length would be 36 divided by 4.9, which is what? 
7.35. When you multiply those two together, you should get the 36, right? Um, so those are the dimensions of the printed area. We're going to make sure we answered the actual question here. Um, find the dimensions of the page. So that would be the outer dimensions. So it's going to be 6.9 inches by 9.35 inches. Yep. And we know that the minimum point is not going to happen near the endpoints because if we do a really, really tiny width, we're going to have a super, super, super long length. And that's going to give us actually a really large area. Right. Same thing if you do a really, really tiny length, we'll have a super wide width and we're going to have a, a large area. Oh. Oh, yeah, 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 because one of them has to be, the length is plus three. Thanks.